it's important that we acknowledge this and celebrate the first Australian who's, on whose lands the Australian National University is located and operates and pay our respect to the elders of the Ngambri and Munawal people, past, present, and emergent. The chair for today's webinar is Dr. Kim Long Cheng. He is the vice president of Asian Vision Institute. And I give this Zoom room to Dr. Cheng. So first of all, thank you so much, Lady, for being our MC for today's webinar and for the kind introduction. Uh, I wish, first of all, to thank Professor uh, Bodhi Reso Sudamo, head of the Indonesian uh, project at the ANU, and my team at the Asian Vision Institute for, for the help. And uh, also special thanks to the K, uh, FKP, the Forum uh, Kajian Tembang Gunan, and the uh, Australian A ASEAN Council, uh, funded by the Department of Foreign Trade, uh, Foreign Affairs and Trade of uh, Australia. And I'm very pleased to moderate today's webinar on the theme of Southeast Asian Economic Development, the state of play uh, to be presented by Professor Hal Hill from the Australian National University. The webinar will uh, run from 10 a.m. to 11.30, so be time today and all those housework uh, our MC Lydia has uh, shared and uh, for our audience, please stay tuned and uh, uh, with any questions, please come back and write to uh, Q&A box or raise your hand. So let me uh, provide a brief introduction on how we proceed to today's webinar. It will be very brief uh, and simple. So it will start with the opening remarks by Luke and all, uh, Deputy Ambassador at the Australian Embass Embassy in uh, Phnom Penh. Uh, second session, second will be the presentation by Professor Hal Hill uh, for about 45 minutes. And uh, last will be the question and answers. And all, at that time, uh, the floor will be given to the audience. So our uh, yeah, today's seminar will be uh, recorded on your YouTube and uh, also will be live. You can ask questions over there too. But uh, with further ado, uh, let me invite uh, Duke Ennall, Deputy Ambassador from the Australian Embassy in Phnom Penh to give his opening remarks. Duke, uh, uh, Luke, uh, the, door is, the floor is yours. Great. Well, thank you, Kim Long. Uh, good morning, all, uh, for those uh, who it's uh, it's morning for. Uh, Selamat pagi and Jumrah uh, Sur. It's uh, it's an honour to uh, provide the opening remarks uh, for this seminar uh, on the state of play uh, for Southeast Asian uh, economic development. Um, as uh, as Kim Long's mentioned, my understanding is it's a, the first in a series of, of monthly seminars uh, that ANU and the Asia Vision Institute uh, will run as part of a grant from the DFAT-sponsored uh, Australia ASEAN Council. I think you've chosen, uh, certainly chosen the right presenter in, uh, in Professor Hal Hill, uh, who not only has uh, very impressive academic credentials, but has also uh, played a very uh, important role in influencing policy uh, on economic development um, uh, in many ways, including uh, by supervising and mentoring uh, many policymakers uh, from around the region, including some who've gone on uh, to be key reformers and, uh, and senior officials and ministers uh, in Indonesia and elsewhere. Um, so you've, you've chosen the right person. I think you've also chosen the right topic, uh, albeit a very broad one. Um, Southeast Asian economic uh, dynamics, I think, prior to the uh, pandemic were already very interesting. Thing, um, but the pandemics uh, made it even more uh, interesting and, and relevant. Um, I think it's very hard to, to underestimate just uh, what an impact uh, that the pandemic is having uh, on the economies of the region. Um, and, uh, and I think even though it's, it's likely um, that all major Southeast Asian economies will return to positive growth this year, uh, although uh, Hal can correct me if I'm wrong on that, um, but uh, this growth will, of course, be from a lower base. Uh, and uh, my understanding is that many economies 
uh, even by the end of this calendar year, won't have reached their 2019 uh, GDP levels. Uh, so that's a that's a big impact at a macro level, and, and obviously that's trickling down uh, into uh, a whole range of different impacts. Um, here in Cambodia, we've had massive changes over the last 12 months. Um, tourism was one of the, the, the biggest drivers uh, of economic growth, uh, and I understand there are uh, uh, people here uh, working on tourism in, uh, in Cambodia, tourism policy in Cambodia. Um, that's, uh, that's obviously been decimated as a result of the pandemic. Uh, I've, I was in uh, Sim Reap at the end of last year. Actually, I've been, I've been there a couple of times since uh, the onset of the pandemic, and, and that's that major city is now essentially a ghost town. Um, uh, so that's, that's had uh, had big impacts there. Uh, there have been some silver linings, though, uh, at least here in Cambodia. Um, one of them is uh, that uh, social protection is now a key uh, priority for the government. Uh, when I first arrived here three years ago, I started having conversations with a range of stakeholders, with the government, uh, with the World Bank and with other development partners about uh, social protection. I mentioned, oh, look, you know, Cambodia is now, uh, as of 2016, it's, it's, it's a middle-income country, a lower middle-income country. It's time to start thinking about social protection and no one was interested. Um, it, it didn't have much traction. Um, but since the pandemic, um, the government realises that social protection is critical um, for both economic and political reasons. Uh, and, um, and I was very pleased, honoured, uh, to join uh, Prime Minister Hun Sen in launching in June last year an emergency cash transfer system uh, for the 15% poorest households in Cambodia. And that's been an enormous success. Um, so we're, we're now sort of approaching one year of that program, uh, and, and and over that year we've seen uh, I've seen a 180 degree turn in uh, the willingness of policymakers to engage with the idea of social protection. So that's certainly um, a, a silver lining. Um, another, I think, is is the accelerating uh, e-commerce here. So we've seen um, very rapid transfer to e electronic payments. Um, I've seen Cambodian farmers joining online markets. Uh, there's a flourishing local app uh, scene with apps for uh, for food delivery and, and mo urban mobility. Um, and, and Australia is supporting all of this uh, in a number of ways, uh, including through the Economic Research Institute for uh, ASEAN uh, area, uh, which we're funding uh, to deliver capacity building for primarily for uh, for government officials um, in Southeast Asia uh, to really make the most of these uh, e-commerce trends. Uh, across uh, Southeast Asia more broadly, uh, I think it's fair to say that the pace at which economies recover uh, and the types of economic activity that drive the recovery uh, will have massive impacts uh, on the 650 million people that live in Southeast Asia uh, and, of course, beyond, including uh, in Australia. Uh, I think the public policies that are put in place to support that recovery uh, are going to be uh, uh, very impactful uh, in many ways. Uh, Australia is, of course, watching these dynamics very closely, uh, and the Australian government uh, has made it very clear that economic development in Southeast Asia is uh, increasingly important to Australians. Um, we can see uh, Australian businesses uh, looking to diversify their supply chains um, uh, towards Southeast Asia in many cases, and, and the reason um, for that is to build res resilience to future shocks, uh, whether they are natural security shocks uh, like pandemics or, or climate change, or of course geopolitical tensions. Um, and, uh, and on the latter, uh, Australia is looking for ways now increasingly proactively looking for ways to ensure that economic strategies uh, for recovery in Southeast Asia um, don't involve putting too many eggs uh, in too few baskets. Uh, so we want to build um, economic and strategic resilience uh, in Southeast Asia uh, by assisting our neighbours uh, in the region to build uh, dynamic economies, and, and a key part of that will be um, having multiple sources of investment uh, and uh, investment uh, and economic activity in a diverse range, um, uh, or that engage with a diverse range of, uh, of export markets uh, all around um, not putting too many eggs 
uh, in too few baskets. Uh, we're also really uh, keen uh, on the Australian government's part to uh, to support efforts to bridge the development gap in Southeast Asia. And this is a term uh, often used uh, by Cambodian government officials, including uh, officials in the uh, the recent bilateral senior officials talks that Australia held with Cambodia in, at the end of January. Uh, there was a much talk uh, about the development gap uh, in Southeast Asia, and that, that refers to the gap in human capital and economic development uh, between some of the poorer Southeast Asian countries, Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, uh, and, and the rest. Um, so we are very keen to support those countries to, to help bridge that gap. Um, we're also increasingly focused on, on supporting measures that reduce, I guess you could call it the development gap uh, within um, various Southeast Asian countries. And by that, I mean the, the significant uh, socioeconomic inequalities, uh, which could uh, threaten um, uh, economic and uh, political development uh, in the region. So we're not just concerned uh, about uh, these things and interested in these things, but we're actually doing something. Um, uh, my personal view is uh, uh, it's uh, it's good that we're now finally uh, doing something um, uh, to uh, to address some of these things in a, in, a, in a really big way. Um, and, uh, and many uh, of these sort of measures were announced uh, at the end of last year by Scott Morrison, our Prime Minister. Um, but I'll give you um, I'll give you five things that Australia is uh, is actually doing major things um, to uh, to really address. Uh, economic development uh, in Southeast Asia uh, as we see uh, the recovery from the pandemic. Um, one is uh, we've uh, committed $300 million uh, to supporting vaccine access in Southeast Asia. Uh, and that's part of a $500 plus million dollar, um, commitment to support vaccine access across the Indo-Pacific, uh, but a, a big chunk of that $300 million dedicated to Southeast Asia. Here in Cambodia, it's $35.7 million. Um, there's uh, Scott Morrison, uh, the Prime Minister, also announced um, a $232 million investment uh, in the Mekong Australia Partnership, um, and that's to support economic development uh, in uh, during the recovery. Um, and I can talk a little bit more about that uh, later if there are questions. Uh, there's also a $57 million commitment to support the ASEAN Secretariat to drive more economic integration across Southeast Asia. Uh, there's a $1.5 billion loan to Indonesia. And of course, there's the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, uh, which is a major uh, free trade agreement. Uh, it includes new rules for SMEs, government procurement and e-commerce. And we expect uh, RCEP uh, to create uh, opportunities uh, across Southeast Asia. So here in Cambodia, uh, we're, we also uh, are implementing a range of measures to support uh, economic development, including um, during the, uh, the post-COVID recovery. Um, and uh, one of the things that we're investing in that's relevant to today is uh, an initiative called uh, Ponlok Chomne, uh, and that is Khmer for sprouting knowledge. Um, so this initiative um, involves working with uh, knowledge sector institutions uh, and, and uh, Cambodian research institutions, including uh, the Asia Vision Institute, um, to undertake quality public policy research and to engage in constructive dialogue uh, about um, public policy issues with policy makers uh, here in Cambodia. So that's a, that's a significant uh, investment. Uh, some of you might be familiar with the Knowledge Sector Initiative in Indonesia that uh, uh, Australia launched about um, 10 years ago for similar reasons. Um, and, uh, and this initiative is based partly on that. Um, but but it's, it's essentially around um, our hope that supporting more research uh, and dialogue on critical public policy issues in our region, um, uh, we hope will ultimately pay dividends uh, for both Australia and the region. Uh, so it's critically important, obviously, to research and conduct dialogue on critical public policy issues like uh, economic development in Southeast Asia. Um, uh, and on that note, uh, I'll hand over to Hal to, to talk a bit more about it. Thank you so much, uh, Luke, for your insightful uh, you know, remarks. 
and as well as the perspective uh, in, in how, you know, Australia can also be supporting the process of economic development in uh, ASEAN, particularly in the low income uh, ASEAN countries. Our next agenda is a presentation by Professor Hal Hill. So before that, let me introduce uh, briefly. So Professor Hal Hill, uh, uh, holds the emeritus status uh, of uh, professorship at the uh, Australian National University. His main research interest is the economic development of Southeast Asia. And he has authored and audited more than 20 books and more than 100 journal articles and book chapters. So uh, Professor Hal Hill has been uh, you know, supporting uh, policy development in countries in Southeast Asia. Particularly, he has been the regular uh, Wazira as an official guest to the Republic of Indonesia. So before further ado, may I give the floor to uh, Professor Halhil. Professor Halhil, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, okay, thank you very much, uh, Kim Long. Very nice to see you again. Uh, and thank you, Luke, for those introductory remarks. And thank you to the organisers for the invitation uh, to participate uh, in this contribution. It's great to see that what Budi and Kim Long are doing. Uh, I think it's a very worthwhile initiative. Uh, and nice also to see Lid. Uh, nice to see you as always, Lid. So let's go. I think we've, we're set to go with my presentation. Uh, I understand a lot of the participants are from uh, Cambodia. So good morning, to you all. Uh, I haven't been to Cambodia now for some years, but I've always enjoyed the visits to your beautiful and fascinating and dynamic country. So um, I think we're in the realm, in the era of what's called Zumbies. Um, uh, Lid reminded me last night. Uh, I think I'm maybe closer to a zombie than a zombie, but let's see if I can make a bit of sense for you. Uh, I'm going to go broad. I'm, I'm going to go broad and I'm going to go historical. Uh, and I, I welcome comments and suggestions along the way uh, and, and the Q&A at the end. Uh, Lyd, uh, are we okay with the screen share now? Um, uh, could you share your screen again, Pahal, because we stopped the screen share earlier. Oh, okay, yep. Uh, so, how's that? Yeah, looks great. Okay, thank you. so let's go. And uh, again, um, thank you for the invitation to, and, and I welcome comments and questions uh, at the end or along the way. Uh, okay, so let's... Um, yeah, so uh, that's what we're talking about. I don't need to spend much time on this map. Uh, I'm, I'm going to be talking fairly broadly about the 10 countries of Southeast Asia, members of the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. Uh, uh, Timor-Leste, East Timor could perhaps be included and it's, it is relevant to some of the discussion, so I might touch on that briefly. But the focus is really on these 10 countries. And as I say, I'm going broad and I'm going historical. Uh, and, uh, to, to kind of give perspectives. So the most important starting point is, is, is this graph. Um, it, this, is, this is poverty incidence um, for, for five of the countries in, in Southeast Asia using the World Bank, uh, if you like, middle income poverty line, the POVCAL. And the story is a very clear one. It's, it's a, a story of dramatic improvements in living standards. Uh, the series can go back further and that would confirm the story. Uh, and, and this is arguably the most important <laughs> development indicator that economists want to look at. Um, it, it's just for the five countries. Um, uh, we haven't got Cambodia in there, but if Cambodia were in there, that would be showing a similar kind of story of rapid declines in, in poverty, in headcount poverty incidents. Um, and two other features of the graph, which will be obvious to you, are first of all, the, the poverty incidence generally correlates with per capita income. That is, the richer the country is, the lower the poverty incidence. Uh, hence, it's on this indicator very low for for the for the richer countries, Malaysia and Thailand. Somewhat somewhat higher for the for the for the other countries, but still declining quickly. 
That's the first point. The second point is just to illustrate the diversity within Southeast Asia. And the diversity in particular, you can see by the slopes of the lines, they actually do differ substantially. In particular, uh, Vietnam has had this really dramatic reduction in poverty incidence, uh, whereas the Philippines has been a good deal slower. And I'll, I will talk a bit about the Philippines as we proceed, because in some ways, historically, it's been something of an outlier, although it has, in a sense, joined, rejoined the mainstream uh, more recently. But you can see already starkly from that graph the differences. Uh, this is a, a bit of important history, and what it's really telling us is Southeast Asia compared to other major uh, uh, developing regions uh, and the, in, at the end of World War II, the beginning of the decolonization process, Southeast Asia was a very poor region uh, almost everywhere. Uh, you can see the gap in the discontinuity in the series is a proxy for wartime devastation also in Southeast Asia. And then you see the ascent, and the ascent really gets underway from the late 1960s. Uh, and... and Two important observations in this graph will be obvious to all of you. First of all, uh, uh, around uh, around the late 1940s, 1950, it was Southeast Asia as a whole was similar to Sub-Sahara Africa. Uh, subsequently, it's left Sub-Sahara Africa behind, and that's just reminding us that the really big development challenges in globally now are really in in Sub-Sahara Africa more than anywhere else. The other point to note is that Southeast Asia was a, a lot poorer than Latin America uh, in, in the early 1950s, uh, but it has now overtaken Latin America. So th this, the dynamism of Southeast Asia is a really uh, key point to keep in mind. Uh, one other observation, just, uh, just for the technically minded, you'll see at the top, um, I've lifted this from The Economist, but it's from the, the, the Madison uh, database that's named after the famous economic historian Angus Madison, who everyone should still be reading even though he's no longer with us. You'll see that the per capita GDP is actually as a percent of US GDP per, per capita. Why is that? Well, it's a, it's a measure in a sense of how countries are performing relative to the global frontiers. So if a, if a country, for example, is growing at 2% per capita GDP, but the global GDP is also growing at the same rate, in a sense, there is no convergence. The countries aren't progressing relative to richer countries. And the key point to note here is how Southeast Asia is pretty dramatically uh, converging towards, towards higher income levels. So that's just a reminder of situating Southeast Asia in the global economy. Okay, so thinking about Southeast Asia, what are some of the key words? Uh, well, uh, these are some which come to mind. There are certainly others. Uh, dynamism, I'm going to be talking about dynamism. Diversity, obviously, uh, 10 countries, highly diverse. Uh, open economies and, importantly, what economists often call open regionalism, which I'll come back to. Uh, the word miracle is is often applied to Southeast and East Asia more generally. I'm, I'm going to talk about that miracle a little bit. It's perhaps an overused word, but it's sort of shorthand for something useful. The final point I'm going to mention is the end of what may be termed exceptionalism. And what I'm referring to there is that the, the period of really rapid growth in Southeast Asia, at least for some of the richer countries in Southeast Asia, now appears to be behind them. Question mark. I want to come back to that point. Okay, so here are just some some indicators of the, of the countries. Uh, I think they're they're pretty well known uh, indicators, uh, so we don't need to spend a lot of time on them. Uh, but just to emphasise the the obvious points, um, there's a great deal of diversity uh, within the region. The range in per capita income uh, is 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 about twenty to one or more, depending on how you measure it. That's actually a more higher, it's greater diversity than other major economic blocks, for example, the European Union. So Southeast Asia has this great diversity. 
Uh, also great diversity in size, in living standards, uh, et cetera. Although the, the diversity in living standards isn't as great if we look at uh, alternative measures of it, in particular the United Nations Human Development Index. So the gap in terms of per capita income is much greater than the gap in terms of uh, in terms of living standards as measured by this composite HDI index. On institutions and political systems, no really clear picture, certainly no, no clear picture on political systems. Of course, the earlier East Asian model was, was, was you know, these were, these were well-managed economies, but they weren't particularly democratic economies. And in a sense, Southeast Asia is following that road to some extent. And on institutional indicators, um, lots, of, lots of indicators, I'll come back to this point later, uh, there's no really clear picture. They tend to correlate with per capita income. So there's the obvious question of the direction of causality. You know, is it institutions causing development or vice versa? Obviously, it's a bit of both. Uh, so, so that's an issue which we'll discuss a bit. But this general picture, I think, is, is clear enough. Uh, so that's some of the takeaways which are, which I've mentioned already. Uh, okay, so on uh, Luke rightly mentioned in his introduction, um, the issue the issue of the day is clearly is clearly the COVID crisis and uh, and beyond. Uh, and this is obviously a really major test of governance, perhaps the most fundamental test. It's clearly the most serious. Uh, economic crisis uh, for Southeast Asia since the Asian financial crisis of 1997-98. And uh, just looking at this table, which is the cases, um, the cases per one million population, fatalities per one million, and estimated GDP growth for 2020, uh, a number of striking features uh, appear. First of all, uh, and of course, bearing in mind the caveats of the of the quality of the st uh, statistics, clearly in the case of cases and probably also fatalities, they're very approximate. But a, a few really striking features come out. Um, uh, the first is that the countries which have managed the managed the COVID health pandemic well are also the countries which but where the economic decline has been the least, or in fact, they've kept maintained economic growth. So in a sense, to say you've got to choose between health and, uh, and the economy is a false dichotomy. They're complementary. That's the first point. Second point to emphasise is the, is the huge variation in country experiences, even within this one region. So, in a sense, uh, putting aside the special case of Singapore, you know, which is, in a sense, uh, is, is atypical in, in many respects, uh, the star has been uh, Vietnam. So, Vietnam controlled COVID, uh, COVID pretty quickly and pretty effectively. Well, I think we might have some participants from Vietnam in the, in the group and we might like to hear from them. I think we have a, a general story of why they did it, how they did it. They closed borders quickly. They had test and trace arrangements. They had effective local quarantine uh, and, and, and the public health and education systems more or less held up. So Vietnam is, in a sense, the standout within Southeast Asia and it got an economic dividend. That is, it actually had positive economic growth uh, in, in uh, 2020. Uh, in effect, the only major country to have positive economic growth uh, in 2020. Uh, at the other extreme, there's really large diversity in country outcomes. Um, for example, Thailand, which managed the, the COVID pandemic reasonably well, took a big hit. Uh, tourism, obviously, it's tourism dependence, a big factor here. Whereas Indonesia, which, uh, as, as our friends could tell us, struggled somewhat with managing the, the, the pandemic, actually was not hit nearly as badly. And there's a whole lot of reasons for that, which I haven't got time to discuss. It's going to be uh, a lot of great PhD dissertation topics coming up, I think, uh, in, the next, in the next few years. Uh, but this diversity of outcomes is really striking for countries which in other respects are somewhat similar. So there's a range of economic, uh, demographic, uh, geographic, political health factors involved in explaining these outcomes. Now, included in this table and some others 
uh, the two Asian giants, uh, China and India. And here also you see uh, huge diversity in China, of course, where the pandemic, uh, the source of the pandemic, but actually managed it very effective, very quickly. And like Vietnam has had positive economic growth last year, the only major economy in the world to have positive economic growth last year, whereas India really struggled. And you can see the economic hit for India is much more serious uh, than China. In fact, India is quite arguably the most serious, even more so than the Philippines. So that's just giving you a, giving you a sketch. Uh, I can't help but observe that, uh, and I'll mention this a bit later, there are many estimates of governance quality, so-called governance quality, and this in a way is really the ultimate test of governance when a really major crisis hits, like a pandemic crisis. And guess what? Um, Vietnam, which doesn't rank, I forget the number, but Vietnam's ranking on these governance indicators is not particularly high. It's way lower than, for example, United Kingdom or the USA. Uh, and guess what? Uh, <laughs> Vietnam handled the COVID much better than, for example, those two major Anglo economies. Uh, and the benefit was, as I say, the economic dividend. So just a reminder, there are a lot of governance indicators around. I'm going to refer to them later, time permitting, but this is in a way the real test. Uh, and it sort of tells us something about countries and their institutions. Okay, so a bit of history, a bit of history. It's it's maybe obvious, but just, to, just a reminder, I don't need to spend much time here. Southeast Asia, of course, is a new relatively recent geographic construct, as the wonderful book by our ANU colleague Anthony Reed has reminded us. Uh, the history matters, particularly the colonial era, histories of shaped development trajectories in many ways. But it's important to remember that path dependence doesn't last forever. And I will come back to this point because it's quite important. Uh, in the, in the mid-1960s, the three Asian developing giants Indonesia, India, and China were all struggling with economic development. And they, in a sense, have been written off as not being developmental dynamic states. And of course, that path dependence notion was disproved quickly. Uh, thinking about Southeast Asia, uh, I like to think of it in, in terms of a few snapshots. Uh, the hope of, of after the end of the Pacific War uh, and the beginning of the decolonization process. Thinking about Southeast Asia more recently in the mid-1960s, um, Southeast Asia was actually a very gloomy place. Uh, there's a famous book written about it called Southeast Asia in Turmoil in the mid-60s. And that's obvious uh, why the, the Vietnam-Indochina uh, War was intensifying. Ch China was closed off and in a sense unpredictable. There was the famous Pyongyang, Peking, Hanoi, Phnom Penh, Jakarta axis of NEFOs. If you don't know what a NIFO is, it's a newly emerging force. Uh, there was so-called confrontasi with uh, Indonesia unhappy with the establishment of Malaysia. Uh, Malaysia and Singapore were briefly married and then divorced. So the region as a whole um, was a pretty gloomy place and there wasn't a lot of sign of the economic dynamism which was to follow. But from the late 1960s, this was really the era of the beginning of rapid and sustained economic growth, not just in Southeast Asia, but it had it been earlier beginning and occurring in Northeast Asia, in particular in, uh, in Japan and South Korea, uh, Hong Kong and Taiwan as well. So this is, I'm afraid, I haven't got the alignment right, but I'm sure you all know this book. It is actually now uh, almost 30 years old, but uh, it's still a highly recommended read. This was the first miracle I mentioned. And uh, it's, uh, I advise anyone trying to get a, 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 an understanding of the historical dimensions of the region, this is probably as good a place as anywhere to start. And it is part of this general story which, uh, from this map which I owed to Professor D Danny Kwa at the National University of Singapore, who calculates in a kind of arithmetic sense the, the global economic center of gravity, and it's heading it's heading our way. It's heading to this hemisphere, and that just is a, is a shorthand way of saying the economic dynamism of East Asia in particular, and and more recently uh, South Asia. Just to emphasize this economic dynamism point uh, and how 
unusual it is, the the 2008 World Bank Growth Commission, headed by um, Nobel laureate Michael Spence, asked the question, how common is sustained economic growth? They studied uh, historical data for about 100 years, and the conclusion was that of the 150 countries for which they were able to obtain estimates over this long period of time, only 13 of them uh, met the test of, of, of rapid economic growth. From memory, it was uh, have averaging 7% GDP growth for at least a decade. So what do you see in that table? We use, you just see um, it is an East Asian story predominantly, and it's a very small number of countries, uh, economies, I guess you would say, for Hong Kong and Taiwan. Uh, only a less than 10% of the observations met, met the test for inclusion, and they're overwhelmingly in East Asia and in Southeast Asia. The, the other four, uh, uh, in a sense, exceptions in different ways, uh, three of them very small, Botswana, Malta, Oman, special cases, Brazil, the only other major country. And of course, uh, after that 1980 period, Brazil had uh, basically 20, uh, 20 years of economic stagnation. So it's important to keep in mind this case for all the problems we're going to talk about in Southeast Asia, uh, this, this table just gives us this reminder uh, of the importance of this historical record. Uh, one, one, other, uh, one other point to note, if you were asking, if you were going to do this study now, 13 years later, would any other countries be included? Uh, well, the obvious one which could be included is from our region would be Vietnam, which has now had very rapid growth since Doi Moi in the mid-late 1980s. Uh, and Cambodia, arguably, might get pretty close to it and maybe even Laos. So, again, it just re and, and India would be the other case which would now be included, arguably. But, again, just, to, just keep in mind this fact, it's unusual to have economic dynamism in the world. Uh, Okay, so um, uh, sorry. So um, thinking about Southeast Asia over this long period, uh, this this kind of tells us a bit more about the story, and that is um, the, it's Southeast Asia's share of global population, of global exports, and of global GDP, and the the blue line, the GDP line just reminds us, again, that the, the acceleration in economic growth in the region uh, really began to take place from the late 1960s and that um, the, the outward orientation of these economies, as shown by the export share, uh, again, took off and you could argue was one of the key drivers of this, uh, this rising prominence. You can see for the earlier period, in particular, uh, 1950s, 1960s, a lot of Southeast Asia had closed off to the world. Um, Myanmar, of course, became almost a closed economy. Indonesia, Indonesia was was struggling with economic development uh, and it disengaged in substantial part from the global economy. Uh, Vietnam and Indochina were consumed by war for some of this period. So it's really, the, again, the takeoff is from the late 1960s. And if I was clever enough, I would put in country dates as turning points in this process. You would put Indonesia from around about 1968, in a sense, becoming rapid economic growth. You'd put in Vietnam following also the Indochina economies from the mid to late 1980s. Cambodia, of course, after the Paris Peace Accords as well. So just important to keep that story in mind. If you take the story through to this century, just for the shorter period of 20 years, uh, you don't see the same marked uh, acceleration. You, you see rising shares for GDP and, and exports, but it's not as fast. And in a sense, that gets back to the point I was making about perhaps the end of exceptionalism. Still, still dynamic, but not as dynamic as before. Just by way of comparison, what are the other, the two Asian giants look like on this kind of calculus? Well, you see uh, China, uh, in a sense, the, the star economy, uh, extraordinarily rapid growth and rising shares of GDP and, uh, and, and, uh, and exports. 
India looks a bit more like uh, Southeast Asia. That is, it's it's rising, and of course that that's the acceleration of uh, Indian economic development. It's rising, but it's not rising uh, as fast as China. No one else is, in a sense. It's more like Southeast Asia, dynamic, but not but not spectacularly so. Okay, so I've mentioned the diversity within Southeast Asia. Uh, just to recap, I think it's 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 already clear. Uh, Southeast Asia, dynamic, but not as dynamic as China and the the so-called NIEs, that is Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, uh, Singapore. Uh, it's important to remember that around 1970 there were three unusual economies in Southeast Asia. Uh, namely Singapore, Malaysia and Thailand. Why were they unusual? Because they were what Sachs and Warner called always open economies. There's a technical definition for that, but they were basically open economies throughout, especially Singapore and Malaysia. And they had prudent and cautious macroeconomic management. In a way, the two key drivers of, of rapid economic development. As I mentioned, Indonesia joined this group from the late 1960s. Uh, Vietnam in particular from the late mid late late 80s Cambodia Laos as well uh, Burma left the group uh, it looked like it was maybe rejoining the group but now of course a uh, question mark about that and the Philippine the great Philippine puzzle the country that everyone expected to be the most successful development state in Southeast Asia in the 50s and 60s uh, didn't live up to expectations but it has rejoined the the mainstream this century. So diversity, in a sense, is a key point. Uh, okay, within within Southeast Asia, um, uh, this uh, I like to sort of look at this long-term development pattern, and it's just to sort of make a few, just to make a few key observations. Uh, in a sense, um, we don't have long-term national accounts data for all the countries, but for those that we do. We have we have considerable diversity, as I've mentioned. Uh, you see, if you look at the third, the, the last column, GDP 2019, that is pre-COVID to 1960. China, of course, again, is the absolute standout, rising by a multiple of 43. Uh, within Southeast Asia, Singapore, uh, uh, the most dynamic economy, followed by Malaysia and uh, Thailand. Uh, and uh, and Indonesia are doing pretty well, in a sense, pretty similar to India, actually. So rising by a sixfold over this period is, is a remarkable achievement. Now, if we go just to this century, what we see in a sense, um, oh, and by the way, putting aside the Myanmar figures, which I don't think anyone would would would, would regard as credible, unfortunately, going to this century, what you see is... Um, uh, 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 much much less diversity. That is, the growth rates of the of the major economies in Southeast Asia broadly similar, without a big variation. Uh, but you do see, in particular, you do see the catch up effect at work, and that is the the lower income economies in Southeast Asia actually growing a good deal faster than the higher income economies, Malaysia and Singapore in particular, and also Thailand. And so in uh, Cambodia emerges as a really dynamic economy this century, uh, as does Vietnam and also Laos. So you, you're seeing less diversity within the region as a whole, but you are seeing some convergence and catch up. Uh, okay, so I'm, I haven't been looking at the, at the, ch at the chat box and so I'll just continue but please um, please break in if you'd like to um, with comments along the way otherwise I'll just continue uh, okay another big topic uh, just to flag it I, I can't pretend to cover it um, and that is really what's what are the political economy underpinnings of this generally rapid economic development and the crucial question is, if you believe in policy, as I guess we as economists do, think good policy matters, why have good policies and how have they been implemented and adopted? Uh, so diversity of political systems, so very hard to generalise, but there are some recurring elements. In the earlier period, it really was uh, these, if you like, authoritarian leaders 
who really shared growth compacts with their population. That is, uh, there wasn't a lot of democratic space, but in a sense there was rising living standards. And that really was, in a sense, the earlier story of Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, Hong Kong, China now. It was also the case for Suharto's Indonesia, arguably also for Malaysia under Mahathir. Part of the story in that, in that political economy compact was what political scientists have called insulated technocracies. That is, some key parts of economic policy making were off limits to the political, political processes, especially you know, central banks and ministries of finance and so on. So <laughs> with rising democracy, of course, that whole political system has changed in important respects. Uh, which we can talk about later if you like. But in the successful economies, um, I think there are three uh, recurring factors which are present in almost all the cases. That is uh, a leadership which is committed to reform, to growth, which is often single-mindedly and somewhat ruthlessly committed to rapid economic development. Secondly, I think the power of ideas. So leaders want rapid economic development. Where do they get them from? They get them from ideas. Where do the ideas come? They come from all over the place. But you can see a pattern of not just globally ideas coming into these countries, but local think tanks and universities playing key roles. So that's where, of course, the participants in this group, I'm sure, are involved in, in a sense, in forming policy makers. And, and the third element is, it, is generally bureaucracies which are at least supportive or, or at least either supportive or at least neutral uh, and don't stand in the way of reform because often reform does involve de-bureaucratisation, but at, at least it's, um, it's at least neutral if not supportive. And combined with this phrase, which I really like from the eminent Indonesian economist, Professor Mari Pangestu, now number two at the World Bank, and it's a sort of virtuous circle of regional demonstration effects, uh, what Murray and others have called competitive liberalisation, seeing the neighbours reforming successfully and wanting to catch up, having to catch up, has been, I think, a really important part of the story. And, of course, in that context, Japan was crucial. Japan was the first rapidly growing Asian economy. Others followed, sometimes called the flying geese model earlier too. In Southeast Asia, Singapore has played that role. <laughs> Singapore is in many ways so atypical, but it's also been, a, been an important uh, exemplifier of, of good policies as well. Especially economics, one wouldn't necessarily say that it's an exemplifier of, a, of an open political system. Okay, so trying to understand this process is really the big question, the elusive search for growth. Uh, I still like this, I still like this slide, it's now a bit dated, but um, the analytics is more open, economies generally grow more rapidly. What is more open? Um, there are different forms of openness. There's no one single formula. Japan was is open, Singapore open, but they're totally different in many respects, but at least there is this export orientation and a sense of market tests for, for industries which get support. So, and I think I still I still think the best book on this is is by the famous Indian economist uh, Jagdish Bhagwati. There are many others, of course, but his book I think is one of the best. But we know to quote another famous Columbia University economist, uh, Joe Stiglitz, uh, we know that globalization can be and often is an inherently unequalizing process. That is to participate in the global economy. Um, you need to have the prerequisites of that global economy uh, and that, that means you're having a workforce which is equipped to take advantage of the opportunities, uh, a business environment which is supportive, you know, the infrastructure, the finance and so on. But, but it's, it's, it's the general rule is you have to be open to be part of the game in some sense. Uh, in the Southeast Asian context, I think what's particularly important is this concept of open regionalism. And there I've got another miracle by the distinguished uh, Singapore academic and diplomat, Kishore Mabubani and his co-author. Uh, again, maybe an overused word, but if you think back to where the Southeast Asian countries were in the gloomy 1960s and you think of the 
think of the relationships now, notwithstanding all the problems, uh, it's, it's, uh, it is a remarkable transformation. Uh, the, with, without equal anywhere in the developing world. So you, some of you may know, follow some of the other cases, um, Mercosur, which is the Lat southern Latin American economies, Brazil, Argentina, and so on, um, the West African model, ECOWAS, and, and others. ASEAN stands out for its durability uh, and, its, and its regional cooperation. It doesn't mean, of course, it can solve everything. It's struggling to solve the... Myanmar tragedy at the moment, but at least um, in economics, it's been this crucial element of uh, opening up regionally, but in the context of opening up in the global economy. What the late Indonesian economist Hadi Sesastro said was multilateralizing regionalism. So ASEAN is not like the European Union uh, or NAFTA or whatever it's now called, because it's not a preferential trading arrangement in, in practice. It's, and preferential, of course, means discriminatory. That is, you, you give preferences to members only, and therefore you discriminate against non-members. ASEAN has tended to manage this opening up process uh, very effectively. Partly, of course, it's been through the, through the ASEAN economic community. Partly, it's also through, uh, through the, the rules of origin being pretty, pretty unrestricted partly because global factories have come into Southeast Asia and they're governed by the International Technology Agreement. So more than half of intra-ASEAN trade is in the electronics and related industries. So that's, that's, that's also a part of the story, I think. So, uh, so the, the elusive search for growth, I think these are, the, these are the elements which I think have been consistent features of um, of the success story, so we can talk about that later. But I think it's important just to emphasise emphasise these common elements. Okay, I'm conscious of the time. So, uh, Kim Long, how am I going? Can you have we got another five or ten minutes, or how much time? I think, time do I think you have uh, you have about five more minutes. Oh, yeah, five to ten. Okay, good. And then so we, before we open the floor to uh, the questions. Okay, good, good. So um, the elusive search for growth. So that's just really ca ca uh, summarising what I've been talking about. Uh, each one of these, uh, each one of these dot points could, of course, be a seminar topic in itself. So I'm giving you, trying to give you this broad picture. Uh, if you dig deeper, what has Southeast Asia been good at and what can other countries learn from Southeast Asia? Well, I've just illustrated uh, a diversity of strengths of Southeast Asia. I, I won't go through them in great detail, but just to highlight, since the rest of the developing world looks at Southeast Asia and asks the question, what lessons can we learn from it? And, and these are, I think, some of the illustrations, I think, of where Southeast Asia has been successful. Uh, the first one actually is often forgotten, but it's crucial. Uh, Singapore and then Malaysia were the first developing countries to embark on this road of export-oriented industrialization with high levels of foreign investment and participation in global production networks, which are now dominating so much of East Asian trade. So th that's an obvious but sometimes forgotten point. Currently, Vietnam is probably the most successful exponent of that strategy. Uh, a second feature is, I think, sound macroeconomic management. It's back to that earlier point I made that that unless you get sort of macro management uh, being effectively uh, implemented, and that means, you know, sort of strong central banks, prudent finance ministries, uh, it's the rest of economic development almost certainly doesn't happen. And that's it's managed in countries where also there's been quite a lot of political fluidity and complexity. The best example of that in some ways in the region is the Philippines, which had a, a history of macroeconomic crises. And finally, from the crisis, learned that you've really got to have a high quality central bank, a thing called the BSP, which they set up in 1991, and which has endured quite a lot of political turmoil since. So th th these other examples are just, are just illustrations. Clearly, rapid transition from plant to market, Vietnam, followed by its neighbours, Indochina, a great success story. Uh, I like to think since we've got a Cambodian audience that Cambodia is perhaps the most successful example in recent decades of a country experiencing a terrible conflict and genocide 
and and making this rapid transition to high economic growth since the Paris Peace Accords in the early 1990s. Uh, another fine example where, again, back to sub-Saharan -Sahara, sub Africa, so much of it is still consumed by by conflict. So, so these are some of the some of the features I think, which if you if you dig into the Southeast Asian story you get some sense of the diversity of experiences and success stories. Uh, where has Southeast Asia struggled? Well, uh, again, quite a few areas, and it's partly because it's, um, it's managing success. That is, uh, most, uh, almost all the countries now graduated from the low-income group. They're in the middle-income group. There, there is this thing called the middle-income trap, which is a kind of term without any much analytical precision or meaning, but it does illustrate the fact that the, some of the former stars in economic development, for example, Malaysia and Thailand, uh, have lost quite a bit of their dynamism. I think quite a bit of it is actually due to homegrown factors rather than any kind of preordained structural factors, but it's certainly, a, certainly an issue for the region. So these are some of the issues where I think Southeast Asia is really is really confronting and in some cases struggling with reforming the education system, the demographic transition sweeping the region. In the 1960s, the, the concern was a Malthusian trap. Now it's this age getting old before becoming rich. Uh, I think the Piketty story, I'll come back to it in a minute, of rising inequality in some countries is a really big issue. Uh, and developing high quality institutions in a sense uh, the story of really rapid economic development often occurred without much, if any, institutional reform. I mean, you think of Indonesia. Indonesia in the mid-1960s had really battered, battered um, institutions of, from, you know, the hyperinflation and the, the conflict and the political turbulence. And yet when Suharto came in and then in, brought in this exceptional quality of so-called technocrats, uh, the 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 country's economy began to grow very fast, very quickly. Uh, environmental factors, uh, I, I think a big question is this model, the so-called um, so environmental Kuznets curve, you know, you grow first and clean up later, which was clearly the earlier East Asian model um, is coming into question. Uh, in a sense, you could argue high quality environments, it's a luxury good for poor countries, doesn't really, if I may say so, it sounds very parochial, but I look out the window to this um, rather pristine air quality in Canberra. Does it make sense, say, for Manila to aim for the same air quality as Canberra? Not clear it does. On the other hand, uh, when environmental catastrophe beckons, uh, then obviously the, the challenge is much much more serious. And I'll, I've got a graph from my colleague, Professor Buddy, which will actually highlight this in a minute, but it, it's obvious it's the point I'm making. Another general point is, is the commercial class. Uh, I think it actually, I think you actually learn quite a bit from looking at countries and looking at the richest people in these countries and working out where they made their money. In a sense, um, that wonderful book on Malaysia some years ago, uh, Are Malaysia's, Malaysia's Capitalists? Are they so-called rent seekers or real capitalists? I think you learn a lot from looking at where the rich have made their money. And so there's this question of, you know, uh, how much is Southeast Asia developing independent business groups? Not, not just Southeast Asia, of course, it's a big issue for China and a big issue for most countries, in fact. So these are some of the future challenges. I've mentioned them already in a sense, uh, regaining the growth commitment, uh, building stronger institutions. Question there it really is what sort of institutions really matter? And that's a that's a, a huge topic which we can talk about if you like. I haven't really gone into it. Clearly part of the story is is the strong independent macroeconomic institutions. Um, partly it's it's also having a legal system which is in a sense independent of the political process. Partly it's also having checks on checks on government excess through some sort of independent process. So institutional development is a really complex question. Um, people, people like, for example, the famous Harvard economist Danny Roderick say that institutions rule, that is, they're crucial. They're certainly crucial, 
Whether they're a prerequisite for rapid economic development, development is not at all clear to me. I think these sort of processes go hand in hand. Uh, staying open, I think, is important. Uh, it still matters to be globally connected. And in fact, Cambodia is perhaps a, one of the best illustrations of that. Cambodia, uh, after the peace accords, deliberately decided to open up. Uh, and I know it's controversial in some senses, you know, the land ownership issue, the tourism issue, managing a giant neighbour uh, and so on, and inequality has clearly risen in the process. But Cambodia opening up has meant it's a veil of a lot of, a lot of uh, global economic opportunities from garments to tourism and spreading to other, other fields. So staying open, I think, is still a critical issue. And then there's environmental challenges. So the rest of the slides, I, I haven't got time to talk about them, but just to, just to emphasise the point that uh, inequality is an issue for most of the region. It doesn't mean that you've got a lower inequality, but you do need to have uh, opportunities opening up for all members of society, and that's where education system and the labour market is crucial to provide that inclusiveness. Um, Southeast Asian countries, um, like a lot of the world, ambivalent about, about globalisation. This is one illustration of these sort of trade policy intervention, pre-COVID of course, but the story hasn't changed that much. And these are the governance indicators. These are the indicators, I'm, I'm sure you're aware of them, the thing called the World Governance Indicators. As I mentioned, we have to treat them with a great deal of caution since they weren't at all good predictors of, of the countries which would manage uh, the, the, the pandemic crisis better than others. Uh, I gave the illustration of Vietnam earlier compared to the US and the UK. But it, the useful thing about these indicators is it just does illustrate the diversity of, of potential indicators and how to think about them. Uh, and for example, voice and accountability, that is to, uh, democracy. Uh, a lot of East Asia hasn't been particularly uh, strong in this indicator. I showed you the table earlier, uh, but they've often had a effective governance. So you can have effective governance um, like this without necessarily having a lot of voice and accountability, a question mark uh, at least. So just illustrating the diversity of these institutional indicators. Uh, so the final one is just to, just to finish on is is uh, thanks to Professor Buddy who's <laughs> given me this this uh, graphic. We could talk about environmental issues. Perhaps you'll have a separate seminar on it. But I guess the key point really is um, it is twofold. It is that a lot of Southeast Asia is highly vulnerable to climate change. In this case, rising sea levels. Uh, first of all, and so this old model of, you know, grow first and clean up later arguably no longer holds with the same force as it used to. <clears throat> and secondly, be, uh, because it's a global issue, it needs global coordination and cooperation currently with the Paris Accords, but that's where obviously developing countries which in a sense can reasonably say to the now rich countries, look, you had, you were able to grow without any environmental <laughs> constraints or impediments, and now you're telling us we have to. So that's where global coordination and cooperation is really going to be important. Okay, uh, let me stop there. A lot, of, a lot of things we could talk about in more detail, but I'd be very interested to get your comments and feedback. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Professor Halhil, for your very insightful and very informative uh, information, particularly with regard to the history as well as to the state of play of the Asian, uh, Southeast Asian economies. May I now open the floor uh, for questions and for the participants, please write your questions in the drop box, in the in a, a Q&A uh, box. And also, you can raise your hand uh, to ask questions directly. Uh, I think we have questions now in the Dropbox, but may I invite uh, Professor Jha uh, from the ANU? Would you like to ask a question uh, to Pak uh, Hal directly? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh yeah, thanks, Al, for a for an excellent lecture. Um, I really enjoyed it. Uh, I have a couple of questions. 
Uh, one is that uh, I deposited clear to me whether the the, the dollar comparisons for uh, using uh, uh, market exchange rates or they were uh, in purchasing power parity terms. That's the first question, a simple one. The second one is that I understand very well the focus on comparative advantage and free trade and all that kind of thing. But during this pandemic, uh, supply chains have broken very badly. And there is a lot of suspicion and uncertainty about mending supply chains. I mean, countries were caught with no PPEs, with very little testing equipment, mm. while uh, people were dying all over the place. So, I think the the agenda here is is rightly so. I think quite, but demand driven, and we should have a parallel session sometime on how to fix the supply chains so that the comparative advantage becomes meaningful for the countries. Right now, for a policymaker, I don't think it is very meaningful in many countries. That's all. But anyway, I enjoyed your lecture. Thank you, Raga. Um, Kim Long, shall I reply directly? Uh, yes, please. Okay, I'll, so... I'll, I'll pose more questions, yes. So the best way to answer that is, uh, I think the organisers should invite the distinguished Professor Raghav Jha to give a talk on this, because he would be much better at it than me. Um, <laughs> so thank you, Raghav, and yes, you've heard me on this before, so I'm sure that you didn't learn much at all, but it's great that you could join us. So yes, the figures are PPPs. Um, I skipped over that. Uh, I just think they're a, a more useful indicator of relative economic welfare right. as compared to exchange rate GDP. But of course, the latter have their role in particular cases. Um, but uh, Raghav, I think raises a really important point. Uh, what's going to happen to supply chains which have been just so badly disrupted in the future? Uh, uh, look, it, I don't have a crystal ball, Raghav, and as I say, I think you would be um, <laughs> probably better informed to talk about this. My sense is, um, well, a number of things. First of all, I think the sort of global factory thing, you know, for electronics and, uh, and autos and machine goods and so on, is my guess is, is probably going to return, you know, reasonably soon once we've got, you know, the vaccine spread, which, of course, maybe a good two or three years away. Uh, but uh, my guess is that the fundamental imperative will sort of continue, um, you know, in those sectors. But but as you rightly say, governments are really going to have to think a, a bit more strategically and tactically about what can they rely on in the global supply chains and what do they have to really think seriously about uh, developing a local manufacturing capacity, and as you as you rightly said, the PPEs is is the place you would start. Presumably, also the pharmaceutical uh, sector, uh, vaccines, and so on is another one. Uh, I guess also um, inventory policy is going to have to be different. You know, this sort of just in time delivery model won't necessarily work when uh, when shipping uh, transport networks have been. Uh, disrupted considerably. Uh, and, and then I guess more broadly, there's going to be, uh, as I think Luke mentioned at the beginning, the rise of e-commerce, which was, of course, underway already, but uh, is really going to accelerate, and that'll be a permanent feature of the new global economy. And therefore, when you think of comparative advantage, we'll have to think immediately of of, of internet capacity, um, and that's not just for commerce, but also for education, since so much of education is going to be uh, online delivery, and th things like this wonderful facility running running international webinars. I just had an earlier one this, before this one. This is this is now our lives, I guess. Um, so I think it's going to it's going to be a changed world, but I think there'll still be this hierarchy of of you know the more skill intensive activities probably being in the 
technologically more advanced economies, uh, the lower school activities being in countries with a labour intensive uh, advantage, but with these qualifiers that there'll be a lot more e-commerce e activity and governments will want to be a lot more cautious uh, in, in, in having sort of strategic supplies of certain goods. I think we have to be careful with this strategic supply issue because I think it is potentially opening the door for a lot of, you know, so-called strategic strategic import substitution, which probably isn't going to have to be, isn't going to be essential. So I think governments are going to have to think through very carefully what is really strategic uh, and, and, what, and what isn't. Uh, sorry, just to add on top of that, of course, the other big issue in the background is what's happening to the China-US trade dispute. And that's, in a sense, uh, separate from but related to the COVID pandemic issue. And there, I think that is really one of the most troubling and serious challenges for the global economy. And it's one which, of course, Southeast Asia is central. Countries don't want to have to choose, you know, are you in the China camp for Huawei and other things, or are you in the Anglo, you know, European camp? But uh, the big powers, if the if the disputes aren't really resolved reasonably soon to make them workable, then uh, then that's that's I think a really big challenge for countries. Countries will want to diversify probably more than they are at the moment, at least. But to repeat, I think Professor Jai would be a great speaker on this topic. <laughs> thanks, 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 Rocco. Uh, thank, thank you. Uh, let me, uh, you know, give the floor to uh, Luke. Luke, you you have a couple of questions from the participant, and the first of which is from Lindin Che. Uh, he or she asked uh, about how could Cambodia compete uh, on the low cost labor. But uh, before that, he or she thank the Australia for providing a lot of assistance on uh, for human resource development in Cambodia over the past years. And that has played very important role in contributing to the economic and social development of Cam uh, Cambodia. But a uh, way forward for Cambodia, how, how will Cambodia be able to compete uh, based on the current uh, stage of human resource uh, capacity in the country. And, and your, your view, please. And the second question from uh, Lyndon Chair to uh, Professor Hal Hill is uh, about geopolitical competition. Uh, with the rise of global superpowers uh, and that the rising uh, power competition in recent years in the region, what would be the most challenging cases uh, politically and economically for Southeast Asian region? Uh, yes. So there are two questions, one part to uh, Luke and second part to uh, Professor uh, Hal. The, the floor is yours, please. Okay, thanks. Um, I'll, I'll have, a, have a shot at that uh, two-part uh, question. So the first is... Uh, what kind of strategies, I guess, can Cambodia adopt to uh, compete as it transitions, um, uh, as wages increase uh, and, uh, and it tries to compete um, where in, in areas where it's usually had a, or previously had a com comparative advantage around labour costs. And obviously, garments uh, is, is a big industry there um, that Cambodia has successfully managed to bring a lot of people out of poverty over the last 20 years um, through its, uh, its garment trade um, and, uh, and that could, uh, could come under some threat as Cambodia uh, transitions to upper middle income uh, country. Um, uh, and I uh, um, often give me when I ask the same question and that's that Cambodia really needs to look at a, uh, a, what, what the Ministry of Economy and Finance call a plus one strategy. It seems we cannot hear you, Luke. Where, where can the, so, and where can those uh, can those niches uh, be? So, so I think that's that's one strategy that's going to involve. Uh, a significant amount of investment in uh, in infrastructure, 
uh, I think um, logistics uh, is is a big uh, cost of doing business here. Uh, and uh, and if if uh, Cambodia, with support from Australia and others, can invest in in uh, good infrastructure, that will uh, that will make Cambodia more competitive for these. Uh, Thailand plus one and Vietnam plus one strategies. Uh, another element to that, and this goes to the, the second question, um, is human capital. Uh, and Australia is certainly uh, investing significantly in, in Cambodia's human capital uh, through our development cooperation program. Uh, we uh, are focusing, we have to date focused primarily on tertiary education. That's where we see uh, that we have a comparative advantage uh, we're working with a, a think tank, a leading think tank here called CDRI um, to reform Cambodia's tertiary education uh, system. We're also providing many scholarships. We've provided almost a thousand scholarships uh, since the mid 90s uh, for Cambodians to do postgraduate uh, studies in Australia. Um, uh, but uh, I certainly take the point that we need to also look at primary, secondary, and vocational education. Uh, and so that's something we will uh, look to do uh, moving forward. Um, we've started some, some excellent work uh, supporting uh, the, the next generation schools uh, here in Cambodia, which are, uh, are autonomous public schools that are adopting uh, more um, modern learning uh, strategies. Uh, and uh, there are several of those across the country. And, and I've visited one on the Vietnamese border uh, recently, uh, before the current outbreak, um, and that's uh, I think a really important investment that uh, we're helping to drive innovation in the in the primary and secondary education sector as well to contribute to the the human capital that will ultimately be necessary for Cambodia to make that transition from lower middle income country to upper middle income country. Uh, so we certainly want to be part of that. I hope that uh, answers the the two questions. Thank, thank you, Luke. Uh, can I now invite uh, uh, Professor Hal Hill? But before that, uh, there is a related question to the geopolitical uh, rivalry in the in Southeast Asia. Uh, as country faces, as countries face up uh, to rising geopolitical tensions, and governments are talking about a new mantra of self-reliance for the economic and social development. Uh, particularly, uh, that is China. China has been talking about dual uh, circulation, insulating the economy from outside shocks. India's vocal for local on the march, and America is thinking of reshoring their firms. Uh, the question from uh, Kim Son Sot is, uh, what would be the impact in particular on Southeast Asian economies? And I think this question is also related to the question by uh, Lyndon Chair. Uh, the floor is yours, uh, Professor Halim. Well, thank you very much. These are really interesting and big questions. So, uh, and I don't pretend to have all the answers, but let me make a few points. So, uh, Lydin, uh, to go back, Lydin, to your first question, which was directed to Luke, let me just, uh, I can't resist adding, saying something as well, if I may. Who would have thought in the mid 1990s that Cambodia would emerge as quite a significant exporter of manufacturers. Yeah. Um, this was a country which was, as we know, absolutely war devastated. And it's emerged as one of the most dynamic uh, manufactured exporting countries in the world. Uh, and um, it's partly because, of course, it got preferential access uh, to the European market for the GSP facility for garments. Uh, and, and now, of course, it's been so successful there that in a sense, there's a certain vulnerability uh, there's got this rather concentrated export structure, but that's not unusual for a very small economy. Small economies tend to have concentrated export structures. And so Cambodia being heavily reliant on garments and tourism, in a sense, you have to worry about it, but it's not all that surprising. But the key point to note is that Cambodia actually opened up to everything. And so garments was the initial success story, but the spillover effects to other labor intensive activities have been really dramatic. I haven't looked recently, but the footwear exports, for example, from Cambodia are now really quite large for a country of its size. It's also diversified into uh, machine goods and other, other sectors, 
uh, partly when the when the Thai serious Thai floods happened a few years ago, there had to be diversification, and Cambodia was open and the first cab off the rank. So I think uh, I wouldn't be too gloomy about the prospects for these labour intensive manufacturers, but it needs to be you need proactive government policies to ensure you can take advantage of the opportunities. And that means, in particular, having a, a workforce which is equipped and the productivity which is going to support rising real wages as the pressure comes on to increase wages in the government sector in particular. Uh, on the question of the more general issue, which is also, I think, the question raised by is it, uh, Kim Son. So this is probably the biggest challenge for, for a country like Cambodia, but for Southeast Asia in general, how to manage a relationship with these two giants in conflict. And there's no simple answer. Uh, as much as possible, you want to try and maintain relations with both of them. My sense is that will be easier if you maintain ASEAN solidarity, uh, which I know is, 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 a, is a difficult challenge at the moment, but for a very small country like Cambodia and Laos, it's going to be much easier if you're with like-minded neighbouring countries and ASEAN is the obvious vehicle for it. So it's going to require really skilled diplomacy, uh, which ASEAN has been very good at in the past. Uh, it's going to require, I think, uh, getting your, your house in order to prepare for this, for a challenging global environment where there could be these big shocks, whether they're trade dispute shocks or whether they're, whether they're pandemic shocks or anything else, uh, environmental shocks, for example. So you're going to have to have this sort of resilience and that means uh, in the education system, in the institutional capacity, in the macroeconomic management, and we haven't talked about it much, but in the health system. What, what the pandemic has exposed is the crucial importance of having a robust public health system because countries are only as strong as their weakest link in the, in the health crisis. And that requires not just good private health system, which of course the, the rich can avail of, but it requires a robust uh, public health system, which is inclusive. And so I think that's an illustration for the next pandemic, which will certainly happen, if not in my lifetime, in your lifetime, uh, you've got to be ready for it. So, and, and just like with economic crises and economic shocks, you know, global financial crises, there's certain to be another major economic uh, shock of some form. We don't know what it's going to be. Uh, this wonderful book by uh, Mervyn King and John Kay called Radical Uncertainty, a highly recommended book. That's the world we're in. And so you've got to have these buffers, whether they're macroeconomic buffers, uh, that means, you know, prudent fiscal policy uh, and monetary policy. For example, I'm not a believer in modern monetary theory, which says just sort of print money. From, it might be all right for the US, but it's certainly not all right for emerging economy markets, I think. Uh, and it means it means having this education system, health system, so you've got to have the buffers to manage and navigate your way through these really complex issues. And I think that 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 those comments apply to Kim Song's question as well. Um, in a sense, you how to insulate yourself to better manage shocks. So a great example in our neighbourhood is Vietnam, as I mentioned, Vietnam has managed, the, you know, it's still a poor country, but it's managed the pandemic crisis, I think, the best of in Southeast Asia, perhaps except for the special case of Singapore. So it's possible. In, during the global financial crisis, uh, uh, Indonesia and the Philippines and India navigated the global financial crisis pretty well for a number of reasons, including their macroeconomic management. So I think that so I think the key issue is not to turn not to turn your back on globalisation, but back to Stiglitz to manage it more effectively. We can talk a lot more about this because I think it's a really big issue, but that's my kind of a, a, you know, preliminary take on it. I wouldn't mind just adding a, a couple of points to that, just to, to reinforce uh, what Hal said. I think um, maintaining, uh, for, for Cambodia in particular, maintaining relations with uh, a range of partners uh, in the midst of this geopolitical uh, tension is uh, is going to be critical. And that, that goes back to my, my earlier point on um, I'm not putting too many eggs in too few baskets. Uh, and I agree with Hal that uh, ASEAN 
uh, is a key mechanism for Cambodia and others uh, to ensure uh, that they are they're not doing that. Um, I'd also draw attention to Hal's earlier point um, in his presentation uh, on the importance of ideas uh, and uh, and think tanks uh, in particular being a, a really important source of ideas. Uh, I think uh, here in the Cambodia context, uh, that, that's very true. Um, there's a we've actually seen just in my time in three years here. Uh, a real flourishing of, of think tanks. There's a range of very effective, uh, impressive think tanks, uh, some of uh, which, uh, like AVI, um, have a lot of Australian alumni working for them. Uh, and um, I think that uh, the that, that think tanks here in Cambodia and across the region will play a very critical role uh, in providing ideas to government um, on how best to manage uh, the tensions uh, moving forward. So uh, where Australia is very pleased to uh, to work with uh, think tanks and we're we're looking at different ways we can uh, provide resources to those think tanks to the Cambodians working in those think tanks here in Cambodia to provide ideas to the Cambodian government and policymakers okay thank you uh, Luke and uh, Park how uh, can we give the floor to uh, Peter and uh, Pat Peter and uh, next is uh, Ian from yeah, Ian Cockhead. Yes. The floor is yours, please. Oh, hi, it's Peter McCauley here. Uh, can you can you hear me? Am I coming through? Can you you can hear me? Uh, yes, Peter, I yes, can hear you. Pat. Okay, thanks. Hal, thanks very much. Thanks very much for your presentation. I have just two two points to make. Uh, first is, and this draws on what I think is maybe one of the very best briefings on uh, overall growth in the developing world. It's by a report by the World Bank back in uh, oh, over 10 years ago now, 2008, the growth report from the Growth Commission. And it still remains, I think, I, I look at it from time to time, and it still remains, I think, an absolutely splendid survey of issues of growth in developing countries. Now, it makes one absolutely central point. They, they really do stress this point, looking at growth in, particularly in Asia, Southeast Asia. They note, of course, the great uh, success. So that was up to 2008 uh, in Southeast Asia. And the, the, the point that they really stress is openness to the global economy. Now, the point about openness is that it goes well beyond trade there is something of a tendency for people to talk specifically about trade. Uh, and sometimes they mention in the same word as an afterthought investment, but the, the report goes beyond trade and investment. And it, it, it points to uh, a number of aspects of openness. I, I, I just mentioned them very briefly, obviously trade and investment are two of them, but a third, aspect, which is really tremendously important over a period of 30, 40, 50 years, is openness to technology and science. An awful lot of technology, I mean, uh, electricity, agricultural technology, aeroplanes, uh, a lot of medical technology, indeed, we're seeing it right now to the extent that the, the vaccines will spread across developing countries too slowly. This is technology essentially developed in the advanced world. So technology, Fourth is ideas. We've mentioned the importance of think tanks, which is related to technology, of course, but it's somewhat different. And fifth is, uh, is labor movement. So there are at least five elements to openness, of which trade is one, but there are four others that are terribly important. Uh, investment, technology, ideas, and labor. That's my first point about the importance of openness. The second point is, and, and how you've heard me on this before, so this won't surprise you, but I, I guess I am a little surprised that there was not more emphasis in, in what you said about the sheer importance of capital accumulation. Now, you, you've heard me a lot on this, and I think you don't really agree with me because you, you, you don't talk about it terribly much. But when we look at the investment figures, and there are very good investment figures from the World Bank on this as well, uh, in a report several years ago called the <laughs> stealing from uh, Adam Smith called the Wealth of Nations, it shows that the levels of capital accumulation, the difference is quite extraordinary across the world, quite extraordinary. For example, the level of capital accumulation in India per capita is only 
the levels in the United States and Australia. So all over Asia, the region is still very, very short of capital. Uh, anyway, those are my two my main points. That, that, that's enough. The importance of openness and the importance of capital accumulation. I, I, I just want to mention those two. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. So, Kim Long, shall, shall I reply now? Uh, can can I invite uh, Ian as well? Maybe oh, he might have some similar questions. Yeah. Uh, Ian, uh, the floor is yours. So that uh, you thanks. Can, uh, yeah. Um, hi, Hal. Uh, greetings from Madison. It's a long way away. Um, I'm uh, keenly aware that we're already over the ending time for the talk, and I had a very big question, so I'm going to make it very short. Uh, demography. So lots of questions about it. One is, of course, the internal uh, demographic dynamics of the region itself, uh, uh, slowing down very dramatically, except in the Philippines. And what does that mean? But my question was really about uh, the East Asian component of this. Um, as we know, uh, growth fluctuations in Southeast Asia have been very, very strongly correlated with Northeast Asia. A uh, lot, of, lot of evidence of causality running from Northeast Asia to Southeast Asia and growth booms and busts. And as the Chinese economy, the dominant economy now in that part of the world, slows down for secular demographic reasons, uh, what will that mean for Southeast Asia, having hitched its economic wagon so tightly to the growth of the Chinese economy? So, Kim Long, do I... Uh, yes, please. Yes, please. So we're out of time, I guess, uh, which is very convenient because I don't know where to start with <laughs> either of those two questions, uh, except to say, Peter uh, and, and Ian, thank you. Terrific to see you twice in one week, Ian, even all the way in Madison. So, um, Peter, how could I possibly disagree with my former dis PhD dissertation supervisor? Of course I agree with you. Um, so openness, yeah, no, I take your point. It's a multidimensional uh, concept. Uh, I did actually have a slide on the Growth Commission, but I didn't talk about it a lot. But yeah, of course, openness, you're right. So investment, yeah, capital, yeah, I think it's absolutely central. I mean, I guess I suppose I would say that the way I would think about it is that you have this, uh, you have this conducive business environment, which encourages uh, entrepreneurs to invest and that's the way you get economic growth and it's a it's a virtuous circle so it's two-way interactive process we know that a lot of east asia is has been historically quite a high savings region so the question then becomes one of financial inter intermediation but uh, of course you're absolutely right that the levels of capital per uh, capital stock per worker in say indonesia compared to the US, the difference is enormous. Uh, I suppose I would just say development's this long-term process where you have high savings, you import capital from the rest of the world if you're a well-managed economy, and that's crucial to drive economic development. You can't have it without the investment. But so, of course, I agree. So, the, Ian, the demographics, yeah, that's that's a really big issue. I did just mention in passing, you know, the, the transformation from this Malthusian outlook of in Southeast Asia a couple of generations ago to, to uh, the fact that now population growth is slowing. By the way, even in the Philippines, um, the population growth is now half what it was when I first went to live in the Philippines in 1980. So, uh, and so the China's demographic transition, what does it mean? So it means that China's a you know, huge topic, which you would be better qualified to talk about than me, actually. But it, it means that China's economic structure is going to change. It means its labour force, I guess, is already declining um, uh, and will continue to quite, decline quite rapidly. So China will, if it keeps on growing, will lose a comparative advantage even more quickly in unskilled labour intensive activities. They'll go. They'll go abroad, um, um, and Southeast Asia is the obvious place for them if they if they can attract them. Uh, it means also that China will need a lot more uh, unskilled labour of it, it its own uh, for a whole lot of services in particular, and it means that China is going to grow more slowly. Uh, it, of course, the demographic action will move around the world as well. So clearly India's um, population growth is still very strong. Its population is about to overtake uh, uh, China's. And then the real demographic action 
gets going, I guess, in the next 10 or 20 years for, in Africa. So most of the world's population increase from around about 2030 or 2040 is going to be in Africa. So you get this sort of, and that's where you've got to be open because, you know, the patterns of demographic change, which, as you rightly point out, drive a lot of the economic change, is going to shift. And so China won't be the, the primary economic dynamo that it is um, quite soon. And it's going to shift to India and to other, to Africa and elsewhere. But I recommend to the organisers that you invite Professor Ian Coxhead to give a seminar on this topic. <laughs> I also recommend that you invite Dr. Peter McCauley to give one too. <laughs> <laughs> and, and thanks. I'm sorry I'm answering them rather okay. closely. And, and I'm sorry also there are other questions, including, hello, Mick, Mick Cabalfin, one of my former students in the Philippines. Hi, Mick. Sorry, I think we're running out of time to answer all the questions. I Thank you so much, uh, Professor Palhel. I think given the time, uh, we would end the session now. But before that, you know, uh, we are going to organize future webinars like this one, given, you know, there is a, a lot of interest from the audience, from the participants, and uh, they have given uh, very interesting questions. And I hope that uh, we will organize more and then we uh, can provide a floor and opportunity for them to interact with uh, you and with the other uh, professors and also uh, our scholars from across the region. And uh, uh, let me uh, give the floor to Lydia for any un unfinished business. Thank you very much. Thank you all for uh, speaking, especially the panelists. From me, nothing else except to share that uh, we'll have another session on 6 May uh, as part of this regional session with uh, Cambodia, Myanmar, Laos, and Indonesia. Um, that's it from me. Uh, I, before I close the Zoom room, I'll share other events, but feel free to leave uh, when you would like. And, and can I just say thank you again for the invitation and congratulations to the organisers. This is a really uh, worthwhile activity. Thanks very much. Yeah, well thank done you, all. Thank Keep you, up Lou. the good work. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Lou. See you thank in Canberra. Good day, yep. Hal and everyone. Lou, Thanks. thank you so much. Lydia, thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Great to see you, Lou. Sampai jumpa, Lou. Maybe in Indonesia. Yeah, let's hope so. In Indonesia. Yeah, who knows? Who knows? Looking forward to the next event. Thank you. Great, looking forward to it. <laughs>